Hi, I'm Alan Lewis, and we are at Color Lab in Rockville, Maryland. We'll be talking with Russ Sunowick, the president and co-founder of this company that deals with motion picture and videotape preservation. During this segment, we'll be talking about basically four things. Intervention, dealing with films as they come into the laboratory, dealing with films that we identified as being distressed, maintaining film collections that are not in distressed conditions, and lastly, in order to preserve content, the options one has in dealing with a film collection. The fundamental thing to remember about film is that it's composed of three components. A base or substrate, which we see here, this clear transparent material, which is the foundation of the film. A gelatin layer, painted on the film is the term that the manufacturers used, and that gelatin layer contains silver halide chemicals to capture the black and white image, or silver halide chemicals and color dyes, which react with one another to produce a color image. Each of these has enemies in nature and enemies in handling, which must be prevented against. But remember the three things, base, emulsion, and image capturing. The first thing we want to look at is film gauges, the width of the film uh, as it has come into the collection. And this first example we have here is 8 millimeter film, first marketed about 1932, and it was the standard home movie film that developed during the Depression years in, uh, uh, in the U.S. and elsewhere. Another common gauge is 16 millimeter film, developed in 1923, earlier than 8 millimeter and heavily used in television news coverage from about 1948 on. Another gauge, 35 millimeter, the standard theatrical motion picture film produced in Hollywood, shown in most movie theaters, and it is 35 millimeters wide. Another format was the 28 millimeter. However, it's the role that we have uh, as a sample here is nitrate, and uh, it's outgassing and it's interacting with the tin in the can. So the can is really rusty the, the looking. The can is completely rusted, um, and the nitrous oxide gas coming off of this film is having a chemical interaction with the tin. So what, what we're seeing here is um, a piece of slowly degenerating but still very stable 89-year-old film. And, and nowadays the it handling and storage of nitrate film is uh, controlled by uh, National Fire Protection Association Standard 40, uh, which is essentially uh, adopted by fire uh, authorities throughout the country, uh, and indeed throughout the world, uh, for the safe handling and storage of this flammable material. Exactly. If I called you on the phone one morning and said, Mr. Laboratory Guy, I have a film that smells like salad dressing, it smells like vinegar, mm. what could you tell me about it? Uh, that vinegar smell is the beginning of the replasticizer leaching out of the film. The replasticizer uh, was the substance designed into the film by the manufacturer to enable subsequent uh, use on the projector, subsequent uh, and multiple viewings. Uh, it kept the film supple and, and uh, uh, disabled it from becoming brittle. Um, if the film was stored improperly, where there was great fluctuation in uh, temperature and humidity, uh, seasonally, then you've got a situation uh, where the, the plasticizer began to leach out of the film. And with the leaching out, evidenced by the uh, vinegar smell, uh, it began to deteriorate. And what we have here is a pencil. Um, it's rolled up solid. And, and it needs to be relaxed. There's nothing we can do with it whatsoever for preservation until these physical conditions are dealt with. This, th these two photographs represent um, the step before this. So if the film could be caught when the imagery looked like this and these, these striations, these marks across her face uh, is evidence of the beginning of, of the leaching of the replasticizer um, simultaneously with the vinegar syndrome smell. And if the film is caught at this stage, we're able to, just by the application of a cleaning solvent, bring it back to the point where we've canceled the, 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 replastic, the plasticizer leaching uh, phenomenon and are, uh, kind of stopped it in its tracks 
and, and go on to replasticize and, and are able then to, again, put it on a printer, get it to a level that's supple enough to either transfer it to video or put it on a printer and do full film-to-film -film preservation to a polyester intermediate. Film-to-film -film preservation. So the standard of the industry nowadays is still preserving an original film on a new strand of film. That's correct. Rather than going to some video magnetic or electronic format. That's right. So you've added a new term here. We talked about nitrate-based motion picture film, acetate base, and there are a number of different acetates. Now you're talking about polyester. So polyester is another film-based material, probably the last film-based material we'll see for photochemical motion pictures. That's correct. And um, its shelf life is, uh, by the manufacturer's uh, criteria, is a thousand years uh, stored under not necessarily cold storage, but, uh, but cool storage with controlled humidity, so that there's not this fluctuation. So the fluctuation between good and bad, hot and cold, humid and dry, that causes uh, the beginnings of the deterioration. This is an interesting uh, case study here. Th this uh, very faded color positive print is a third generation piece of material if the original material was Kodachrome 60 millimeter reversal. The Kodachrome from which the color internegative was made, from which this color positive print was made with the so soundtrack, uh, clearly a finished film with sound. Um, that Kodachrome original is probably completely stable color wise and not faded at all. Uh, and, and so the first thing to do as an as a, uh, archivist or curator is to go backwards, uh, trace the production backwards to see if the Kodachrome original still exists. If that still exists, better to try to go from that and make a preservation color internegative on polyester film and then a new print instead of trying to save this print. And you don't have the originals available to you, then we go about fixing this magenta fade with various tricks in color timing that um, um, would, for instance, use more green light than, than red to compensate, red green being the opposite in the, in the RGB color wheel uh, from, from red and therefore attempting to neutralize the magenta. Mm -hmm. So it may very well be that for a particular archives that is concerned about preserving this particular motion picture, uh, to take steps first to contact other archives to find out if they've got earlier material closer to the, the original negative or internegative or exactly from which right. this was made and do preservation on that item rather than on this particular preservation of this particular projection print, uh, which is in their own collection. Requires a lot of coordination between archives, which fortunately is a characteristic of our business. Russ, can we determine the age of a piece of film stock? Sure. Um, there, there are symbols put on by the manufacturer uh, on the edge of the film. We'll look at this 35 millimeter sample, and if you, you, you must determine which way to read, right to left or left to right, and you do that by finding a word uh, on, on, the, on the rail. The potential confusion of is this data on the rail of this film being printed through from something else, or is it the manufacturer's uh, uh, information on, on this piece of film that was put on when it was, was, it, when it was made. Uh, and, and this is clearly put on when it was made because there's no other data on the film and it's in a cyclical pattern every 40 frames approximately. And it, it's reading backwards right to left. And so we see three symbols. And because we have a Jim Dandy chart and there are a number of these available on the internet and X plus triangle is 1989. So this film stock was manufactured in 1989. Doesn't yeah. necessarily mean that the images on it were from 1989 if this had been a piece of film that was printed from an earlier generation. That's correct. So for dating the film stock, we can use edge code that we can read, but determining the age of the content is a matter of looking at automobiles, hairstyles, clothing, and those sorts of things. Because so many collections have a preponderance of acetate-based film, I do want to touch again on the fact that we can use something like these acid detector strips to monitor the deterioration of acetate-based film. And there are some things we can do to slow it down. 
Cold storage, very cold storage, or even frozen storage is one good way to slow down or even completely arrest that deterioration. That's expensive. Another way, perhaps less expensive, is to use a product called molecular sieves, which go in the can with the film. The film can is sealed closed with an appropriate kind of tape around the edges of it, and this will absorb the excess acetic acid in the film as it is generated and gets into the atmosphere of the can. Alternatively, another way is to use a vented film can, an unsealed film can, which will allow the film to outgas, is the fancy term that we use, so that there is not a concentration of acetic acid vapor building up in the can.